Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Joe Ugretz. I am the, uh, the Chief Academic Officer at Macaulay Honors College, and I'm really happy to welcome you all to the, the first and what we expect to be a series of similar events, uh, which will feature the great work that our students are doing and, and our faculty in our upper level Macaulay seminars. Um, these are classes that are not required for anybody. So it's, it's kind of a labor of love. The students are there because they want to learn something that they, they couldn't learn otherwise. And the faculty are there because they want to teach something that's really not offered anywhere else. So we really feel these classes are special. And one of the, uh, the nicest things is that through the, the miracle of Zoom these days, I'm not talking about everything else that's going on these days, but through the miracle of Zoom, we can have uh, people without any uh, travel time. I mean, there's no, no public transportation difficulties, so students can come to the class from wherever they are. And we've seen some really great results from that. And one of the things is that the class that we're featuring tonight, uh, or I guess this afternoon, I should say, uh, this is a, a class that uh, could really only be offered, I guess, every four years. It's uh, the election in real time. And we're really pleased to have, as the professor teaching this course, uh, our own uh, Ted Widmer. Um, Ted is here and, and we'll be talking in just a minute. I want to give him a brief introduction. Uh, Ted's a, a historian and an archivist and, and most of all a Macaulay professor. He's uh, been an editor, he's been a, a speech writer in, in the Clinton White House. A uh, little known fact is that he's a uh, accomplished rock and roll guitarist uh, and vocalist. <laughs> Uh, so we're not going to ask him to perform in that role tonight, but it's it's good to know that he can do that. Uh, Ted's recent book, Lincoln on on the Verge, uh, details the just the short period leading up to to that election. So he's kind of uniquely suited to be talking about this election. Uh, in addition, Ted's written about the uh, early de democracy in in New York, about campaigns more generally. Uh, and he really has a lot of kind of insider knowledge and experience that he's always happy to share with students. And uh, I've observed Ted's class. And one of the things that I like most about it is the way that he really gives students the chance to, you know, express their opinions and test them against one another and be really free to, to think what they want and to practice exploring and, and defending uh, their own ideas in class. Um, and that's kind of something that we're illustrating tonight is that uh, we're going to start with some remarks by Ted, uh, but then we also have some some uh, real participation from current students in the class. And let me just quickly uh, introduce these students. We have uh, Helena Macriani from uh, Hunter College, uh, Anjali Bryan from City College. You guys can wave your hands when I say your name because they so they see who you are. Anjali Bryan, uh, Karina Chiki is from uh, Baruch College and Elisa Mateo Saha from John Jay College. And I believe Sumit Das has just joined us. And I don't know what campus Sumit is from, uh, but he'll- I'm from City College. City College also, great. Yeah. So welcome students, welcome Professor Widmer and welcome to, to all our guests. Uh, and I, with, with no further ado, I will present uh, Professor Ted Widmer. Thank you so much, Joe. What a lovely introduction and um, I, I want to repeat back all, all the nice things you said about me. I want to say right back to you. It's such a joy to be a part of this team. And, and I was going to say to be on this campus, except I'm, I'm not on the campus. I'm in my hometown of Providence, Rhode Island, not too far from New York, but definitely not in New York. And I was a little, well, I, I began this semester with both excitement and trepidation. I, I knew the class would be fun and important. Uh, I had a sense going back to last winter, which is when we were first talking about what, what my class would be this fall, that um, the semester is perfectly aligned with the crunch time of the election. It goes from August to December. And I just thought it's, it was too good an alignment to, to miss. So I really wanted to teach a class, uh, it, it sounds paradoxical, but a history class about right now. And Joe, you were so accommodating. And so it was um, on the books last spring and uh, I'm 
delighted that a couple of my students from my spring class are, are in the class this fall. And it has just been a joy from the beginning. Uh, I, I also approach the class with trepidation because of the COVID crisis and uh, 25 other serious problems that we're all going through as a society right now. But from a teacher's point of view, I was not entirely sure how a Zoom lecture class would work. Uh, in the spring, we, we were obligated to go to Zoom or in some cases, um, Google Meet halfway through a semester. We started doing that in March, but we already had the foundation of quite a few classes where we, we knew each other. And so it was easy to keep it going on Google Meet. And I was a little worried about starting a class and also these are long classes. These classes meet once a week for almost three hours. And that's a long time, especially if a professor is droning on as professors sometimes tend to do. So I didn't know what to expect, um, but I, I had great help. One of the things I really love about Macaulay is, and CUNY is its very enlightened attitude towards providing professors with teaching assistants called TLCs. And Kevin Ambrose has been attached to this class and just helps me in so many ways from the Zoom setup, we, we are on Zoom, to the class website. And we constantly update information um, because one of the hallmarks of this class is no books are required. There is no going to a bookstore to buy books. And in fact, I don't even assign books, but to compensate for that, there is a massive amount of reading online in um, articles as they happen. And anyone following this election closely, and I imagine many people out there are, know that it's, it's not, it's not enough to read the New York Times in the morning, that news is happening all day long, all over this country and indeed around the world in ways that affect the election. And so the news cycle is certainly 24 seven. And it's, um, I mean, it's really even ex exhausting. It's like trying to take a, a drink from a fire hydrant sometimes. So I'm, I, I had a lot of articles on our syllabus in, in place of books. And the students will laugh because I've supplemented that with so many everyday articles that I send out. There's a kind of um, blur of emails and that's probably how it feels to a lot of the students coming from me all day long and something I think is important relating to the election. I try not to send an obvious one but we, we have focused a lot on the inner dynamics of this election, how um, certain states, and you know most of them are, are really pivotal, but things change within even pivotal states. So one of the, um, so in addition to this class being all on Zoom uh, and, and the reading all online sent out by me and Kevin, uh, by email to the class, but also posted on our ePortfolio website. Um, in, a, in addition to that, we are um, getting weekly reports from the students on key states. Um, so that early in the semester, I assigned each student a state. Well, actually it, it was a negotiation. I, I talked about states that I thought would be important and the students volunteered to, to take the responsibility for a state. And that has been a thrilling part of this class is um, after the halfway point of the class, I, I turn it over to the 19 students and each one gives a report on what happened in his or her state only over the last week. And the, the research is, is deep and exciting and granular. So they are reading small town newspapers throughout that state and trying to follow TV stories when they can. And there are a lot of other metrics of how we are measuring who is up and who is down. One metric that is very uh, effective is the amount of money being spent by either campaign on television or online advertising. And that's a metric that Joe Biden is actually winning by a fair amount in these very late stages of, of the campaign. Of course, today we're we're seven days out from the, the election. Um, 
at one point I was worried when starting the class, the class actually began on August 27th, which was the day of the Republican convention. And I was worried the, the election might end inconveniently soon for a semester that was going into December. And now I think we're gonna have so much to talk about in the weeks that follow November 3rd um, for reasons that I hope are good as well as bad. I'm expecting a, a fair amount of both, but I think a lot of us expect a kind of mixed verdict on uh, November 3rd. Some states will not have completed their counting that, that evening because of, um, well, and this is very much a, a volatile topic at the moment, whether uh, mailed ballots may be counted after November 3rd, if they are mailed on November 3rd and they arrive a couple days later, can they be counted? And um, many states have said, yes, it's a time of COVID. So of course we don't want people to feel they have to go to voting stations where it's literally endangering their lives in some cases. So mail, mailed in ballots are okay. But President Trump and, and the Republican party more generally have cast a lot of doubt on the legality of mail-in ballots without providing very much evidence to support those claims. And only last night on this historic evening, and there have been quite a few historic evenings just since uh, the class began in late August, but um, the big news was Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed by a 52 to 48 vote in the Senate. But there was another piece of news, which was that um, the Republican, now the um, pretty impressive majority in the Supreme Court, but by a five to three vote last night ruled that um, mailed in ballots cannot be accepted after November 3rd. So that puts a heavy pressure on people to vote on the, the, the day uh, uh, it, itself and to not it, it still varies a little bit state to state, but this was for Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, which is one of the key states, um, a lower court judge had allowed up to six days for the, the mailed ballot to arrive and still be counted. And last night, the Supreme Court said that in Wisconsin, that is illegal. But where this gets confusing is only about a week ago by a four to four vote, in which Justice, Chief Justice Roberts voted with the liberal majority, um, it was permitted in Pennsylvania to do the exact same thing. So it's really a tough election to follow because the states do not observe uniform rules and things are moving around a great deal. So we've obviously talked a lot about the two candidates and their running mates. Um, we've had deep dives into who is Donald Trump, uh, the only New Yorker uh, among the four major uh, presidential or vice presidential candidates. And he does tend to dominate a lot of the attention in a, in a class as well as in, in the election itself. But we've tried to argue the positive and negative qualities of Joe Biden and to talk about how Kamala Harris is, is really added a fair amount of energy to the Democratic ticket. And um, we've now and then talked about Mike Pence, probably not as much. Um, but the, the, the best parts of the class, in my opinion, have been when the students have talked about what moves them. And they do that a lot. I'm thrilled to say, if there are parents on, on the call, that the students are just co-teaching co the class with me. Um, we we share our thoughts week to week. Um, we now know the format of the class, so it's very comfortable. And I love hearing how the students bring in their, their different perspectives. They're different from each other. They live around the five boroughs or sometimes out in Long Island. Um, one student began the semester in Florida and <clears throat> students have connections to other states, parents who live there, or grandparents, and so, there's a lot of um, diversity of different kinds within the class. And um, I, I appreciate that. We even have some political diversity. There are 
one or maybe two soft Trump supporters. And I, I'm really happy to have them in the class because they, they add an important perspective to the class. Um, but the overwhelming majority of the class is, is voting uh, Democratic, some with enthusiasm and quite a few with a feeling that a, a more progressive candidate would have been more to their liking. Um, and, and within the state of New York, there's a strong identification, I would say, with the more, the more liberal end of the, the spectrum, the AOC um, part of the Democratic Party. And that's one thing we talk about is will, if Biden wins, will he be able to keep his own party united? Um, he's trying very hard to unite the country. And he talks a lot about bringing Republicans and Democrats back together, but he will have his hands full uniting his own coalition um, after a certain amount of, of time has, has gone by. Now, among the earth-shaking events that have happened just in the short time since the semester started, we had the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which um, came on a Friday night and really dominated the news cycle um, and, and still is a part of the news cycle because of the Amy Coney Barrett drama. Um, we had the series of blockbuster reports in the New York Times on the release of Donald Trump's financial information, which was very, uh, felt very exciting as that was being released. Um, it's now there have been several huge tranches of information that it's still coming out, uh, but so much other news has been coming out that I feel like that news has been a little bit buried and in, in, in already feels like a pretty long time ago. Um, it was only about three weekends ago that in the middle of, um, I believe that was a Friday night also, we got all this news. The most sensational was that um, Donald Trump himself and his wife had tested positive for COVID after a super spreader event at the White House um, to celebrate the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. So it has often seemed as if the gods were somehow conspiring to to affect this election, but you have to give the Republican party and Donald Trump credit, they never surrender. Um, so it has felt a lot throughout this fall that there are not only two candidates running against each other, but there are really two alternative realities. There are, you could say there are two Americas that two different populations of this country believe in, but really there are two different realities also, one in which COVID is not a very serious problem and it's fine to go to a rally without a mask on and stand close to other people. And you, not only is it fine, you, you like that. And you like that Donald Trump doesn't care at all and seems to have contempt for the virus. And then there's this other reality in which um, events are much calmer and, and people are spread out much more sparsely and that is um, the reality I think most New Yorkers want to live in having, having gotten through the, the virus. So um, we talk about all of these things and the students bring in their perspectives on what it's like to live in New York in the time of the virus, how, how it has changed since March. Um, they've contributed brilliantly on how they perceive the two campaigns and the two candidates on social media. They're all digital natives and really they lead me when we get to that topic. And then they, they wrote brilliant papers on how effective the two campaigners um, are on social media, which is not the same thing as which campaign they support. Um, so we're really having lively conversations week after week. We're feeling um, from our state reports where uh, the energy is in all of these different locales and it has generally been drifting, um, and you don't need me to tell you this, but I'm happy to get into the details later and the students will, they're go going to tell you about their states. But um, what felt like the key states about two months ago when the class was starting were Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. They are pretty much out of reach for Donald Trump at this point now. And the, what are the current key states are Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, they are more Republican leaning states and the fact that they are in play to the extent that they are um, 
suggest that things have moved in Joe Biden's direction over the last two or three months. There's been a tightening, I would say, over the last week. So it is getting close as it did four years ago. But um, I think it's still looking better for Joe Biden than it even did in August when he was nominated. And so um, we are heading toward a result. And we're also talking a lot about us, the Senate race and who, which party will win that. And I'm happy to talk about where I think that's going to go. But a big question is looming up very large over our class and over our country, which is how do we know the result? Um, on the night of November 3rd, will we know? And if not, what are the steps that will happen and how dysfunctional will it become? Will it become like 2000 or perhaps are we going to a deeper dysfunction than we never ever have seen before? It is possible. Um, so the class will continue through that time. And I have a feeling um, even after we go into the time of exams that we will continue to stay in touch because it's just been such a warm conversation. So. Having introduced the class, why don't I turn it over to the students and um, Joe, I can either go back to you or um, we can just go to the first student on the list who is uh, Angeli Bryan from City College who will tell us about a, a very key state, South Carolina. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Angeli. Um, so just a little bit about South Carolina. So it's a relatively um, rural and suburban state. There's not that many um, big cities. The biggest ones are Columbia and Charleston. As far as like major industries go, it's primarily aerospace, tourism, and manufacturing. Um, so similar to some other states in the Southeast, it's been a stronghold for Republicans historically. Um, I think the last time that they voted for the Democratic candidate was in 76 with Jimmy Carter. Um, and in this election, um, I'm not really expecting anything different. I think that Trump will win um, this state. Um, he's been up for about five points or more for like the entire duration of his campaign. Um, but however, it's important to note that Hillary um, lost by 14 points in 2016. So we're already starting to see the margin closing a little bit. Um, and what we've been seeing just going through everyone's state discussions every week is that the South is, you know, starting to move a little bit to the left. So it'll be interesting to see long term um, when the next Democratic uh, president will be uh, chosen by South Carolina. Um, so I think that other than the presidential race, because I think that Trump is going to win, the most interesting part about South Carolina is definitely the Senate race. Um, so the Senate race is between Lindsey Graham um, and his um, competitor, Jamie Harrison. Um, so it seems like these two are like always in the news, usually Jamie Harrison because he pulled in like so much money fundraising in the last quarter um, and Lindsey Graham because he just says like absurd things all the time and it seems like every week I have something new to uh, say about him. Um, so, you know, everyone remembers the use my words against me that was regarding Merrick Garland um, in, when Obama was president and now of course um, the Senate just confirmed Amy Coney Barrett yesterday so I'm sure that he's very glad about that. Um, but it just shows that, you know, he hold, he doesn't really hold himself to his word unless it's convenient for him. Um, so he's also in the past, you know, been in favor of term limits. And then here he is running again. He's been in the Senate since 2003. Um, so he's a little bit flip, flippy, floppy, wishy-washy, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now we, he also said another absurd thing he said was the good old days of segregation. He said that in the Coney Barrett hearing, um, he said he used it with sarcasm, but I didn't really detect any sarcasm there. Um, so it just always seems to be something with him. Um, and now I'll move on to Graham, which has been like a little bit of like hope in South Carolina. Um, he's definitely been motivating people to go register to vote and get out the vote. Um, so he's an African-American candidate. Um, he was a lawyer, but ultimately decided to come back to his hometown and teach high school so that he could encourage the students to go um, and pursue collegiate degrees. Um, he was also the chairman of the South Carolina DNC. Um, so he's been performing really well in debates. And like I mentioned before, um, the most notable thing about him is his fundraising numbers. So he raised $57 million last quarter, which broke all the records um, amongst the Senate candidates. Um, so he's been primarily putting this money into television ads, I think about 65 to 70%. Um, and then he's using the other money for digital ads and radio ads. Um, so right now he's targeting um, black voters as well as suburban women voters. Um, who um, he's going to need to, to beat Graham um, next week. 
Um, and I think that his um, methods have been working because there has been a spike in voter registration amongst people of color in South Carolina. Um, and South Carolina is expecting a record um, turnout next week. So just some final stats. In February, uh, Harrison had 20% name recognition. Um, and today he has 90% name recognition. And that's due to all the money that he's putting into ads. And it's estimated that the average voter in South Carolina sees about 200 Harrison ads per day. Um, and in February, Graham was leading Harrison by 17 points. And today polls have him about even. Um, so it's really exciting. And I've really enjoyed studying South Carolina so far. Thank you so much, Angela. That was absolutely great. Um, our next student presenter is Karina, Karina Chiki Narvaez from Baruch, who will talk to us about Ohio. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Karina. I'm a junior at Baruch. And for the next couple of minutes, I'll be talking about Ohio. So Ohio is the seventh most populous state in America. I like to start off with that because a lot of people like to think that Ohio is just some small state in the middle of the country, but they're not. They're really important in this election. And just to emphasize that, I'd like to share that uh, Ohio has uh, voted for every president except in the 1960 presidential election when John F. Kennedy beat Richard Nixon. So Ohio is a very important state and that's why I chose to follow Ohio for the semester. So like I said, um, they're mostly rural and suburban um, population. Most of their population is uh, white, 80% white. Um, and most of them are on the older scale. Most are uh, 65 years and older. So this is important to understand because this is leading into why Trump won Ohio uh, back in 2016. He won with an eight point lead, which is a very big lead compared to how they're doing in the polls now. Um, I'll continue with the polls. So actually um, the polls are not very telling right now. It's sort of on one side, one is winning and then on the other, they're not. So after the first debate, Biden was winning by about a point, almost a point. And now Trump is winning by a point also. So it's, it's give and take, it's really not uh, very dependable. So. Ohio is one of those states where you're going to see what happens the night of the election. They have started their early voting on October 6th, and actually they've had a record high uh, number of new voters, exactly 8 million new voters uh, this year, which is a huge number. Their population is almost 12 million. So that says a lot about how many people are willing to go out to the polls and vote. And um, most of the new voters are actually Democrats. So that's uh, slightly leading into who might win, but um, we again have to see the night of the election. And um, another topic that I like to talk about is COVID. Um, right now they're reaching another new wave. Uh, so far they have about 200,000 cases with almost 5,000 deaths. And the governor of Ohio, uh, Governor Mike DeWine, he's been very strong on social distancing and all the protocols uh, for COVID. However, a lot of Ohioans aren't really adhering to those policies. A lot of the Ohio uh, citizens don't really appreciate the, um, the suggestions the governor is giving. There's actually calls for citizens to make a citizen's arrest of the governor. And there was actually um, a plot to, um, sorry, let me just look at my notes because it was so crazy when I found out, a plot to hold Governor DeWine under house arrest. So similar to what happened to uh, the Michigan gover governor, they're trying to do the same thing with the Ohioan governor, which is kind of crazy because Governor Mike DeWine is a Republican and he won in 2018 because President uh, Donald Trump supported his campaign. So he got a lot of his supporters to vote for the Republican governor now. But now a lot of uh, Ohio citizens are very against the governor. And uh, Donald Trump had a rally last month and he had the governor come. And when the governor came on the stage, everybody in the crowd started booing the governor. 
And the president was like, come on guys, he's a nice guy. So uh, the governor is really relying on Donald Trump's support. And I'm sure so is Donald Trump, but the people don't really like the governor right now. Most of it has to do with the COVID situation. Um, and another part about Donald Trump that I wanna to touch on, uh, he's hosted a lot of rallies in Ohio, which is something that uh, Joe Biden has been lacking on personally, in my opinion. So just in the past two weeks, Ivanka Trump was in Ohio two Fridays ago Pence was there last weekend, Mike Pence. Karen Pence was there last Thursday. Donald Trump Jr. was there on Friday and Mike Pence was also there on Friday. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, movement in Ohio and not a lot of the same on Biden's side. Biden went to Toledo, which is uh, a very high manufacturing uh, population. There was actually a car manufacturing um, plant that was closed this year. It was the last one there and it was closed. So Biden is trying to get his voters in Ohio to vote for him by promising the same thing that Donald Trump promised in 2016, which was to bring back manufacturing jobs. So Ohio is a very big uh, toss up state and uh, the polls are very close. It's not a good way to call it right now. So we'll just have to see when the election comes. Thank you so much, Karina. That was that was great. Um, next up is Summit Das from City College, who will talk about Colorado. Hi, everyone. My name is Summit. Um, I'm actually presenting about Alabama because um, throughout the semester, I've been following two states, Colorado and Alabama. That's right. I should have said that. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's a, it's okay. Um, so one of the reasons I chose to present on Alabama is not because of their presidential race, but because of their Senate race. Alabama hasn't had a Democratic senator since 1992, and in 2017, when Jeff Sessions, who was the Republican um, senator from Alabama at the time, he went on to become Trump's attorney general. And because of that, he had to resign his Senate seat. And there was a special election um, in 2017, and during that election, Doug Jones ran against Roy Moore, um, who was the Republican challenger, and Doug Jones is the, um, the Democrat who's the, who's, who won that election by about 20,000 votes. So that was a really small margin. Um, but one of the reasons why Doug Jones was able to win that seat in the first place is because his Republican opponent had a lot of sexual misconduct allegations. And that's one of the reasons why people attribute a Democrat um, challenger um, gaining a seat in a deep uh, red state like Alabama. So Doug Jones is running um, again this year to keep his uh, seat against Tommy Tuberville. And according to the polls, Jones is at 41% and Tuberville is at 55%. And the interesting thing to note is that Tuberville is not a political, uh, he's a political newcomer. Um, he was the previous um, football coach of Auburn University, which is one of the largest universities in the South. And he is really popular in the state um, because of his poll numbers and because he has complete support for Donald Trump and Donald Trump's endorsement in the state. Um, in the money raise, Jones has raised $24.5 million and Tuberville has only raised $6.7 million. So even though Jones's Republican challenger um, is, isn't raising as much money um, as Jones, he is up at 55% um, in the polls. And one of the key takeaways from this race is because the Democrats have to win a lot more seats than Republicans. Republicans only have to keep their majority. Um, this is one of the races in, the, um, in this election where a Democrat is expected to lose. Um, in the presidential race, um, Donald Trump is expected to win Alabama by um, 18%. Thank you so much, Summit. And I, I wanna applaud you for doing two states, not, not one. That, that's an option for students and, and a few took it. Um, our next student is uh, Helena Magrinian from uh, Hunter College who will talk about Wisconsin. 
Hi, I'm Helena. Um, so I initially chose Wisconsin um, because it was a swing state and because the election was so close in 2016. Um, as some of you may know, Trump won by just under 1%. Um, in comparison to Clinton. And so I was curious about that. But further into my research, I learned that out of the 72 counties in Wisconsin, 23 are swing counties. So kind of like swing states on a smaller level. Um, and what's interesting about that is that since 1960, pivot counties or swing counties um, in Wisconsin have matched the national election results 77.39% of, of the time. And so looking deeper into that, I found that Wisconsin was actually a very interesting state to look at because of the difference in political opinion that can exist there. So out of those 72 counties, 23 counties in Wisconsin that voted for Trump in 2016 voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. So looking at this election is definitely an important one. And there are three ways that I've been looking at it. Um, firstly, is through the scope of the coronavirus and how it's affected people in Wisconsin. The second way is through nominee presence, Joe Biden visiting Wisconsin and Trump visiting Wisconsin. Um, and also in voter turnout, especially because what, have, what has just happened um, in terms of the court ruling in Wisconsin with the absentee ballots. So let's just look at today um, really quickly. So as of today, Biden is leading by a 7.1 uh, lead in Wisconsin in comparison to Trump. To clarify, this number comes from 538. Um, it's an updating average of the 2020 presidential general election polls, and that accounts for every poll's quality, sample size, and recency. Um, so pretty accurate usually, um, but you know, of course, we don't always just rely on polling and when we're looking at these discussions, especially since what happened in 2016. Um, but first, let's look at coronavirus. So as of Sunday, the positivity rate, including multiple tests of the same person, is now at 13.1% in Wisconsin. So 13.1% of their, their population has tested positive in the last week. Um, and they're averaging uh, 3,870 new cases per week. That is down from last week. Last week they were at 4,077, but not a big enough dip, I would say, for everyone to feel a general sense of well being in the state. Um, in addition, it took them seven and a half months to reach their first 100,000 cases, but just over a month to reach another 100,000. So, to put all of that in perspective, um, on top of that issue, we also have to think about nominee presence. So in 2016, Hillary Clinton put very few resources into winning Wisconsin. She hadn't even visited the state. She hadn't visited Milwaukee, which is a really, really key, um, I guess, like part of looking at um, who's going to win the election in Wisconsin. Biden has adjusted this strategy, though, even though in August he was saying that he wasn't going to travel to Wisconsin to accept his nomination. He has since adjusted um, his like visitations to Wisconsin. So he'll be visiting the state for the third time, uh, despite their coronavirus surge. He'll be doing that this month. Um, Kamala Harris has also been there once. It was her first campaign stop after being nominated, and she's also held a virtual rally there as well. Um, on her visit, she met with Jacob Blake's family and toured Black businesses in Milwaukee, um, hopefully to increase um, the voter turnout for the Black community as well. Um, something that has been an issue in the past was a decreased amount of polling workers in Black communities, and so they had to shut down certain polling locations. So that's something that the state is also addressing as well. Um, and then the week that President Trump was diagnosed with coronavirus was the week he was supposed to have his rally in Wisconsin, which their governor actually asked that they put off prior to his diagnosis um, because the infection rates has just started to spike there. So since then, he has scheduled two rallies. One was held last Saturday and the other one is gonna, was held yesterday as part of a five stop tour in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nebraska and Wisconsin. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of the physical presence of both nominees in the state. And then finally, we have voter turnout, which I guess now has become a little bit more of a, a tricky subject. So during an explosion in absentee voting this fall, Wisconsin communities have exceeded um, half the turnout they had in the presidential race four years ago, which is actually very outstanding. Um, the leaders in absentee voting by mail are usually Democratic suburbs. That also accounts for Milwaukee and Madison. Madison is important specifically because there's a large college there. So a lot of the younger population, college educated students have been voting earlier. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, that reflects upon like a, a largely democratic vote. That's just to say that democratic areas are voting early. Um, and then as of Tuesday, more than 1.4 million ballots have been returned, including 352,000 that were cast early in person. So if that's 48% around of the total votes that were cast in the 2016 presidential election. And to put that in perspective, that's around 10 times more ballots that 10 times more ballots that have been returned by mail than in typical presidential elections, which I suppose to some extent we can expect, but I would say that's a significant figure. Um, and then now looking forward um, to how people will be handling their absentee voting, given the fact that they can't really mail in ballots. Um, there are 30, 320,000 um, outstanding ballots as of Tuesday, 
which amounts to nearly 18% of the 1.7 million absentee ballots requested. So the hope going forward from the Wisconsin Democratic Party is that people will be dropping off those ballots in person. Um, and then the hope is that the coronavirus situation gets better or that voting reflects um, that they want a change in how the administration is going to be dealing with it going forward. Thank you so much, Helena. Fantastic report. And our last student presenter is Elisa Sate Mateho Saha, who's from John Jay College, and she's going to work on Arizona. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so Arizona is a really interesting state. And the reason that I picked Arizona is because it had a history of being Republican. And in recent years, it has had this fluctuating shift towards a more progressive, more democratic side. Um, and particularly because of the growing population of young Latino voters that are voting there. So um, in 2016, Trump won the state by like one percentage point, one to two percentage points, depending on where you look and what the percentage ends up being. Um, but two years later, they had a midterm election and voted in the senator into their Senate, and that's Kristen Sinema, who is now one of two senators from Arizona. The other senator um, is Martha McSally, who actually is the interim senator who's filling in for McCain after he passed away. And she is now running to continue holding his seat against uh, Mark Kelly, who is a former astronaut and a activist for gun control. So it's an interesting race on both fronts. And I'll speak more to the Senate race first. So in terms of the Senate, it's fluctuating from time to time. And most recently, 538 has posted older data. But their average there is that Kelly, the Democratic candidate, is leading by five percentage points. And a lot of people attribute this to his large amount of fundraising and how he is advertising on social media and getting out younger voters. Additionally, over the past four years, Arizona has kind of moved away from Trump. They seem to be continually disagreeing with him. And I think part of that goes back to having so many young voters become active from 2016 until now. Um, and a large part of those people are also experiencing COVID in a very different way. Um, so Arizona has a decent amount of rule and still has a lot of people in a single county, Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is. Um, and they've been activating active a lot um, in regards to Black Lives Matter and also against uh, immigrant restrictions and DACA. And a lot of that is associated with So as time moves, it seems as though the state has been becoming increasingly democratic. Um, and that's reflective in the five point lead that Kelly has. In addition, uh, McSally, who is the Republican candidate, is continually siding with Trump, just recently voting for Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation, and has this negative association with the public in Arizona. So that's pretty much what's going on in the Senate race. It's interesting and has continued to change, but for the most part, it seems as though Kelly will pull through there, um, which will be a huge loss for Republicans in the Senate overall and hurt their majority. Um, when it comes to the presidential race, there has been a lot lot of attention there and a lot of money has gone into Arizona because it was such a close call last election. Um, so Trump has been continually campaigning there and trying to disassociate from McSally because Arizonans don't like her. And over time, this has kind of helped him. And so he's um, significantly uh, closed the gap between him and Biden that was there before. And so it went from being a five point lead when I was seeing in the beginning of August to now just being Biden leading by 2.8 percentage points. And part of that has been attributed to the fact that even though COVID is getting worse, there is a large population apart from the Republican roots, and that might not go away anytime soon. And so there is the possibility that Republicans will pull through. However, on the other end, this large group of Latinx voters that are being activated alongside people who are negatively affected by COVID um, are really activating against Trump. Um, and lastly, what's interesting in Arizona is the small percentage points that are going towards third party and independent uh, party candidates. So Jorgensen, Joe Jorgensen being the most notable, who's a libertarian candidate, has polled at getting like around 3% of the voter, uh, voter percentage points in Arizona. And that has actually been detracting more from Trump than it has been for Biden, which has allowed Biden at some points to have larger leads. So depending on what happens on November 3rd and what the mail-in voter count is, it looks as though Biden could have this one, but um, you know it's too close to say for sure. 
Thank you so much, Elisa and Karina and Angeli and Helena and Summit. You can see how lucky I am to get to come to talk politics with these 19 students every, every Thursday morning. Um, we have time for questions. I want to begin with a warning from today's science section of the New York Times. It's, um, I'm so old fashioned, I still actually read the paper New York Times. And there's a small article saying if you pay too close attention to the presidential election, you run the risk of stress and possible heart disease. So I just want with that health advisory, um, I want to ask anyone on the call to either send a chat question or if you can unmute yourself and ask me or even better the students um, more more questions about their states. So Ted, there are currently five questions. And so the first question is coming from Emmanuel. So the question is, South Carolina has a sizable African American and increasingly college educa educated population. That said, the state tends to be generally inelastic. My question is, can we trust the state to move left over the next decade? Or can we attribute the shift we see between 2016 and 2020 to a predictable response to a uniquely diverse, divisive, divisive president? What, what a good question. Um, Anjali, you, can I kick that one over to you? Uh, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we went over in class is like due to like the high level of voter turnout, are people excited about Biden or do they hate Trump? Um, so I think maybe that's one of the factors that's going into, um, you know, the, the shrinking of the gap between the two parties in South Carolina. Um, so I think that like over the next decades, they will um, maybe slowly move left. And the reason that I could say that is because just looking at Lindsey Graham's race, because, you know, Lindsey Graham so tightly affiliates himself with Trump and you see South Carolinians voting against him um, in record numbers and voting for Harrison. So I'm not saying like next election, they're gonna be, you know, the Democratic candidate's gonna be plus five, but maybe they'll turn into a purple state. Um, and I also think that it depends on post-Trump, what does the Republican party look like? If they rebrand and they come back and, you know, go back to sort of their old ideals, I think that South Carolina will still continue to be um, the deep red state that it is. But if they keep going um, with this Trump projection of whatever his Republican party is, um, I think they will move to the left over time. Fantastic. Thanks, Anjali. Okay, the next question is for Karina. I know you talked about Ohio. So the question is, in Ohio, we've been seeing the state shift more Republican than other West Belt swing states. Why is this? Yeah, so um, I think a majority of this has to do with the demographics of the state. So like I said earlier, Ohio has almost 80% of the population is white. And in contrast, uh, there's 3% Hispanic population. So I just say this to say in comparison to like national demographics, there's about like 20% Hispanics just in the entire nation. So for one state to have only 3%, the seventh most populous state out of all the 50 states, that just says something about maybe the lack of diversity that is in the state. And um, another point to this is a lot of people in that state, they make their living off of manufacturing jobs. And most of those plants, especially automobile plants have closed. And so this is terrible for people who are living on these jobs, people who have been working at plants for almost their entire lives and then they close. And then when you have a candidate who comes in 2016 and says they're gonna drain the swamp and they're gonna give back all the manufacturing jobs, who wouldn't vote for that candidate if you're suffering from these issues? So I think uh, a majority of it has to do with the demographics, but also uh, Ohio isn't really tied down by um, sort of party politics. They vote for different candidates. They voted for Obama in both of the presidential elections. But I just think for Ohioans, they really uh, felt the Make America Great Again slogan because they've been suffering for a long time. They have felt forgotten for a long time. So I, I really think that the demographics, but also Trump's persona really spoke to them 
they really believed in him and we'll see if they keep believing in him again. Thanks, Thank Karina. You. The next question is on Alabama. So this goes to Summit on Alabama and aside in 2018 Mississippi, Senate hopeful Democratic Mike Epsey came within 8% of his successful Republican opponent who happened to be the first woman the state sent to Congress. This year, a rematch will occur wherein Epsi claims he's found the addresses of 100,000 Obama voters who haven't voted since 2008. While a long shot, long shot, what can Epsi learn from gains made by Senator Doug Jones in Alabama? Hi, Manuel. Thank you for the question. Um, I think this is a really interesting trend where you see um, a lot of Democrats um, who are getting a lot closer to their Republican challengers, um, especially in the 2018 midterms where you see a lot of um, House districts that swinged who voted for um, Trump but ended up voting for Democratic congressmen and congresswomen. Um, I'm not really sure about the specific situation in Mississippi, um, but as uh, referring to your, um, but um, referring to the voter um, uh, addresses, I would guess that since um, those voters haven't voted since 2008, that means that they also didn't vote in 2012 for Obama. So I'm not sure how big of an impact they would have in voting for Joe Biden if they weren't willing to vote for Barack Obama in his second, um, in his reelection. Um, so that's for that. And referring to Doug Jones's uh, victory, I do think it is an outlier because for one, the margin of victory was really slim and because his Republican challenger, the Republican candidate um, in 2017 was also very unpopular. Um, he was not just unpopular, um, but um, so when the Supreme Court ruled that, um, when the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage, the Republican candidate um, in 2017, he refused to acknowledge that. And he was actually um, uh, the state Supreme Court, I think in, in Alabama, they censored him because he was making so many, um, like he was doing so many of these things that he, that he isn't supposed to. Um, so I think because of all the baggage that the Republican candidate brought to that election, that provided a path for Doug Jones to come in and take the seat. Um, but it, so he was able to take that seat um, in 2017, but in his run for um, re-election, um, his current challenger, Tuberville, won his Repu the Republican primary by 20 point margins. So which shows that um, there is still a lot of heavy support for Donald Trump and for Republicans in general in Alabama. And I think um, there is little for Epsi to learn from Doug Jones. Thanks, Summit. So the next question is on Arizona, and this is for Elisa. So what exactly is Mark Kelly doing online and otherwise that has been so successful in getting out the vote? Yeah, so Mark Kelly is better at fundraising because he's more popular on social media. And I think part of that goes back to uh, predating when he was running for Senate. He ran a, a nonprofit that works for gun control and his wife was actually shot in the face in a mass shooting that happened in Arizona, which gave him a lot of press at the time, coupled with the fact that he's an astronaut, makes him a very likable person with a like, heart-wrenching backstory per se. And so a lot of people are responding to him better on social media than they are to McSally. Um, and so he's been getting more fundraising. He's also been doing more out-of-state fundraising because it's such a big deal to beat a set, like to have a Democrat win another Senate race and get another Senate seat. Like we're seeing in South Carolina, people from outside of Arizona are pooling, are sending more money um, to these really interesting Senate races that are happening in hopes of flipping the Senate. Um, so he's just m more spread out. And I guess he has a bigger base outside of just Arizona, which has made him a more effective online presence. Um, and just having more money means you have more options. It means you're able to just do more. So um, in that sense, he just has a more robust platform when it comes to being online. And I, I see the second question is also about Arizona. Should I 
read it out and just go into it. That would be great, thanks. Okay, second question also from Emmanuel is, on Arizona, we're seeing unpopular Senate Republican women nationally see Mississippi. Is there a tangible bias for the state's dislike of McSally before and after her race with cinema? Um, and I'll say that this is a shift um, uh, with the Republican Party, I think largely white suburban women are moving away from Republicans, especially those that have a college education. And this is just a large dispopularity and disagreement with those Republican ideologies as they become more apparent with um, different Republican rulings, like moving again, like having Trump be the face of the Republican Party when he is so problematic when it it comes to women kind of disassociates all women from the Republican Party. And McSally has been very pro-Trump, uh, which has been a problem for her. And I think that's where a lot of the dislike is coming from. She is not working with climate change. She is not helping immigrants. She's against DACA. And all of these things are stimulating this new voter population coming in that is younger and more likely to be college educated, right? Uh, and this growth is just moving people away from the Republican base. Great, right, thanks, Elisa. So the next question, going back to Summit, do we know how Senator Doug Jones is spending his money to reach Alabama voters? I unfortunately did not look into how the campaign money was spent, so I can't answer that question. Thanks, Summit. The next question, is what will it take to get rid of the electoral college and base election results on one person, one vote? Could I start that answer? Maybe someone could um, jump in. Um, so I was also following um, the Colorado uh, Senate race and one of the ballot referendum in Colorado is for voters to approve whether Colorado should stay in the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So that's an agreement between 15 states currently with a total of 196 electoral votes. Um, that's important because you need 270 to win the presidency. And what that compact essentially means is that once there are enough states with enough votes to get, that, to get past that 270 vote threshold is in that compact, then all of those states will vote together, um, regardless of how the state, um, how voters in the state voted. Um, if a candidate wins the national popular vote, then all of those states in that compact will give their electoral votes to that candidate. So this is one way where you can get around the electoral college, um, because in order to change the electoral college, which is written in the constitution and in various amendments, you would need to pass um, another amendment to restructure um, our federal election system. And I only found out about this because I was following Colorado and I was following a local newspaper, um, which, um, was um, which was encouraging a lot of voters in Colorado to keep the state in this pact. And 196 votes is not far from 270. Um, and I think it's, it's definitely possible, but you will definitely need a few more Republican states, uh, Republican leaning states to approve because right now there's only democratic states that are in the pact. Thanks, Summit. So oh, I'm gonna add, to go ahead. Oh, so um, just adding to that, part of the issue with the electoral college is it has become a partisan issue. It has become seen in recent years as like the Democrats are the only ones that are really against the electoral college and Republicans because they've been benefiting from it um, or for the electoral college at the moment. But what people really need to think back to is earlier elections where this has occurred and Republicans didn't benefit and Democrats did benefit. Um, and there's an interesting daily podcast that I will send in the chat to everybody to listen to if you want to learn more about it. But um, I think part of the issue, aside from getting people on the compact and getting different states to agree to this, is separating this from a partisan matter and just making it clear that one person should equal one vote, because that's just something that we should agree upon. It shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Um, and I definitely think that's something that's holding us back from getting rid of the Electoral College. 
Thanks, Lisa. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add, but we have three more questions and I know um, we're a little bit over our time, but just to get to Max, I know Emmanuel, you had another question, but I wanna look at Max's question where he's, I worried that the amount of out-of-state money flooding into democratic campaigns in places like South Carolina will mask a lack of local support. Will voters grow to resent Schumer's Senate scheme? And I believe that's going to Angeli. Yeah. Um, so whether or not the money coming from out of states is masking local support, I think that it is. I don't think that the fundraising total alone is enough um, to predict what the result of the election will be. Um, and we've seen that in a few states. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, even some would say Doug Jones is out fundraising his competitor and he's way behind in the polls. Um, so I do think that it is masking local support. I think it just makes it that much more important um, that there's proper polling done um, so we could have a better way of predicting the election and that the candidates actually take the time to campaign within their own um, states and not just depend on playing ads on TV. Thank you, Angeli. So this question is going out to, to all panelists and this is coming from our Dean Mary Pearl. With the Lincoln Project and other groups of former Republicans working to defeat Trump, what do you see happening to the Republican Party after the election should Trump lose? This is actually something that I believe we spoke about in our last class, um, because when you look at like the Republican Party at the moment, it kind of seems like there are almost like true Republicans who have been following the Republican ideals for so long. And then there are Republicans who will kind of switch over their ideas based on whatever Trump is doing. One thing we spoke about was in particular, the millennial and Gen Z generations becoming just shifting their ideology just a bit. We were looking at metrics like um, their religious affiliations. You know, our generation as Gen Z is the least likely to be affiliated with a religion or a religious group. And so that takes away kind of like the appeal to evangelists or the appeal to like highly religious or, or highly, uh, I guess, issues that are highly focused around religion and religious affiliation that would kind of get, um, I guess, put on a back burner. Um, you look at this country becoming more diverse racially and ethnically. I think that that's also a factor that we have to consider when we look at where the Republican Party is moving forward. It's going to need to, I think, embrace a bit of a, a diversity of ideals that maybe traditionally it hasn't been open to. And I do think that while maybe they'll stick to their core ideas, they are gonna have to shift just, maybe left is not the right word, but they'll have to open up um, their policy ideals to something a little bit different than they traditionally have been. Um, and I, I just think going forward, it's it's going to be less about, uh, you know, Trump versus anti-Trump, of course, regardless if he wins or loses. But I think that their, the Republican Party as a whole is going to have to reevaluate their their um, approach to gaining a, a greater voter base in this country if they do want to continue, um, you know, having any kind of, I guess, longstanding shot against the Democratic Party, I would say. Okay, this next question is also for the, the panelists, and this is coming from Emmanuel, and it's on a subject of power. We can expect the Democrats to make a play at judiciary reform. That said, the, sen the Senate will serve minority rule. If Democrats attempt to pack the Senate by making DC, Puerto Rico, and territories like Guam, the Virgin Islands, and American um, Samoa, official states, what kind of backlash should we expect from your states? I, I have a question for Emmanuel, Charmaine. Why isn't he in the class? That's a good question. He has a lot of good things to say. I can start on his question. Um, I think Arizona would be an interesting response. I think there is definitely some affiliation between different Latinx countries and different like uh, countries that have been in places of oppression from colonial powers. And so there might be some support from the Latinx voters, especially younger, more progressive voters to approve um, new, like current territories being made states and having actual power in our uh, Congress. But I do think there'll be a large amount of Republicans and moderate Democrats that don't see this as a positive aspect because they don't completely understand um, all the issues with having territories and holding territories. And I think it would be a majority of Arizona that would push back against um, like current American territories becoming states with full congressional voting power. 
And the last question, what are the races that will determine your state's redistricted districts? How big of an issue is this in statewide politics? I can also start that. Um, I can't speak about my state, but I will say um, Virginia, um, uh, Democrats won the Virginia uh, legislator um, in the 20, as part of the 2018 blue, um, blue wave. And I think that's really important because Virginia has typically um, voted for a lot of Democrat, uh, Republican um, presidencies and Democrats won that legislator after um, Republicans have had it, held it for decades. And because of 2020, because this year um, we have the census taking place and there's going to be a lot of redistricting, um, a lot of the House races are also really important because, um, not the House races, a lot of the state um, races are also important because that will control, um, that will um, determine who, which party controls the state legislator and which party gets to do that redistricting. Um, but I think Democrats do have a really good shot at taking back a lot of the state legislators and um, helping push that um, movement forward. I'll add just that most of us have been focusing on the federal elections and I think the state legislator elections are really what's going to matter there and so we might not know the specifics. Um, I'll add also that I think states that are growing faster like Arizona are going to to take away um, representation in places like New York, which have a much more uh, like slow to stagnant kind of growth. So that'll be interesting to see once um, it's reallocated after uh, everything's tallied up and redistricted and such. So it looks like that's all of the questions that was posed to the panelist. Well, I want to thank these brilliant students for contributing so much, but I also want to say they contributed naturally because they always speak like this in every class and it's just been a, a joy for me to teach. So um, thanks to Macaulay for letting us get our, our class out to a few more people today. Thanks, Ted and all, and thanks to all our guests. The, uh, the session has been recorded, so if you know people who, who will be really sorry they missed it, we'll be posting the link and everybody can can share in this great discussion. It was really fascinating. Thanks to everyone.